Hello, welcome to Campfire Chronicles, episode eight, I think. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> uh, today, you have the pleasure, I guess, of not listening to Andrew and Robbie, but instead, two other people. Myself, Brian Lynn, and... And me, your other co-host, Thomas Sennard. Excellent. And the first thing we want to do is we want to thank our patron supporters, um, you know, every donation that you guys uh, give to us, it helps us make Adventure Archives better and it helps us, you know, put out more videos. So we could not do this without your support. Anyways, <laughs> the uh, topic of today's podcast is going to be learning from our experiences. And what I mean by that is every time we've taken a camping or hiking trip, after it's concluded, I've always felt like there was something that I've learned from that trip, whether it be something simple, you know, if it was a small lesson, like what kind of gear to bring or, or you know, what kind of brand I should buy or something like that. Or if it was something larger or on a more deeper sense, how I relate to people, you know, or you, we do a lot of philosophical talk on our camps, too. Um, but there's just always been something that I've learned and I feel like that I've always grown from every experience that I've taken. It's very true. I, every time you go out into nature and to some degree, you end up taking something back. Most of the time it's not physical, mm -hmm. uh, unless you steal like a, I don't know, a squirrel. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the, <laughs> it's the factor that when you go out into nature, you are less distracted by so many things. You have a lot of time to think about things. You know, you don't have your phone or your laptop or computer, at least for our generation. You know, those things distract us a lot in real life. So I think that's why we tend to learn a lot when we go out hiking and camping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Brian, I, I know you were talking about some uh, some gear. Now, what, what type of gear were you talking about? Like, Well, you know... Uh, my gear has changed and evolved a lot ever since I first started. Uh, I mean, the first backpack I ever had was um, a piece of garbage from Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, was it like a real backpack or was it like a school backpack? That it you, was. It you was know? technically a real backpack, like uh, like as real as you can get from Walmart. Like it wasn't just a you know your normal school backpack. Mm -hmm. It had the straps and things, but the quality was terrible. It was was not big enough. It was probably more like a. a a day pack was what it was probably more designed for, for like hiking rather than overnighting. And, um, back in that, back then I was concerned more about price, you know, mm -hmm. um, just start, I had just started hiking and, um, the first trip that I used it on, um, was to, it was Hawking Hills. The first trip that we took it to. What, what um, year was that? Oh, I don't know. That was, was that 2008? Was that before Yellowstone? Oh, it was definitely before Yellowstone. Okay. Um, I'm really yeah. bad with the, the it, it dates was probably two, on our trips. It was probably 2008, 2009. I don't know. Yeah. Regardless. <laughs> I only re think regardless. of our trips as episode numbers. <laughs> <laughs> episode negative 65. <laughs> yeah. But I realized that by, I mean, just by how uncomfortable I was when I went hiking with those things, that it was definitely something I needed to improve. And um, when we took our trip to Mohican, that was a winter trip. And I had this... I had actually borrowed Thomas's sleeping bag, which was a zero degree bag. And the only other sleeping bags that we had were these 30 degree bags. And we brought two of them because we had two and like layered them so that Andrew could use it. But it was not sufficient and it was an awful night. And immediately after that trip, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to invest in a warm, lightweight sleeping bag. You know, price be damned. And basically the bottom line was that I... Just, I found out that if you want to have a pleasurable experience when you're camping, you've got to put some money into it because, and this is actually true f just in life in general and more so has it been, it's that the more money that you put into something, you're generally going to have a better quality. No, I, I hear you. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of times in our podcasts or, uh, or episodes, we'll talk about how, uh, you know, it's great to go out in nature and it's great to, you know, stop worrying about money and other things. Well, to be fair, Andrew talks about that a lot. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and there, there's a nice blend between the two. On one hand, you want to just go out into nature regardless of, you know, don't worry about money, don't worry about anybody, anything like that. 
Uh, but on the other side, I mean, if you if you pay for like a a ten dollar backpack, uh, you're gonna get a ten dollar backpack compared to a thirty dollar backpack. And mm-hmm. what matters is you know how is the distance, truth, and, how, and the wear and tear of it. You know, mm-hmm. You're yeah. gonna go through about you're gonna have to buy a backpack basically every hiking trip if you get one for ten bucks, uh, versus if you get a nice one for fifty bucks. You know that'll last quite a few quite a few big trips yeah and it's even more important for camping because when you're camping i mean you're doing rough things you're you're throwing your backpack on the ground you you know you're using it and carrying it over through you know through harsh weather and things so the money that you put into it you're gonna get something more reliable and i'm not just trying to say only rich people can camp but it's definitely a long-term investment that you're making when you buy this gear Mm -hmm. and that is something that i've learned it's probably something that i've learned with every single trip I've taken, like I said, if it was something big or something small, it's something that I've learned. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting not to get off topic here, but mm. you know, I'll sometimes go to the mall and I'll see a bunch of people buying like really nice hiking pants or yeah. hiking hiking boots mm. or a hiking shirts like REI. Oh, and it's like oh, I just get it for the fashion. I'm like, come on, you're yeah. you're dishing out that much money to to get something that's really nice, and you're not even going to use it for its intended purpose. But you know they'll they'll use it for fashion mm-hmm. when it's like oh come on you got to use it for what it's intended, uh, but anyway yeah, it's yeah. it's just interesting that you know there are two sides for of every story you know one someone can't go out and buy the gear they want for a passion they're interested in and on the other side you have people buying gear for something they're not passionate about mm-hmm. so it's just interesting I don't know yeah and you know it is a big investment to buy the gear. Um, we've or at least personally me it's been a situation where i've bought a couple pieces of gear over time you know like here and there so it wasn't like an initial big investment um for people who may be jumping into it seriously like for their first or second time they may might be like oh this is super expensive but i'm telling you right now you make the investment it'll be worth it absolutely yeah. same with cameras too <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's a different topic <laughs> yeah that's a different to- that's something that might pertain to us and not many other hikers or campers <laughs> uh well I, didn't you have a story about shenandoah and uh some yeah gear there uh so shenandoah that was also another trip i think where i took i think i had the blue backpack i no 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 i i don't remember anyways <laughs> the blue backpack <laughs> so shenandoah national park in virginia um this was, I would say, our first real backpacking, um, you know, overnight experience. We were going in our alone. We were going to be in a place where there's, you know, very few people. And then we'd be hiking out by ourselves. And we would bring everything we needed to sustain ourselves. And so we got to sh- the ranger station probably like a few minutes before it was supposed to close. And we had not <laughs> had any registration prepared ahead of time um and andrew had not chosen a trail so we got to the ranger station and the ranger was fortunately still there we got our registration and then we we're like so what kind of trip what trail would you recommend and he like looked at us and we we're like yeah could you tell us and then he, so he gave us some trail i can't remember the name of it now um and we you know, drove over to that trailhead and we started hiking down and the trail itself wasn't that bad, but it was not amazing. It was all forested and you really didn't have any good vistas or views or anything. So that was one thing that stood out to me about Shenandoah was that there was really nothing to behold. It was just all trees and that was all you could see. Back, backing up a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, since that experience, talking about things that we've learned, always make sure when you go to a national park or a national forest, anywhere, you know what trail you want to go on. Uh, from what I, I, I wasn't there for that trip. Um, yeah. I, oh, I remember what I was doing. <laughs> um, but that park ranger was really nice. Now, uh, all, every park ranger I've ever encountered has been some of the nicest people I've met. But uh, you know, they can get a little frustrated with if you just get to a place and be like, show me what to do. Yeah. It's like, okay, no, no, you got to tell me a little bit more than that. I can't plan you. I'm not a vacation agent, travel agent type mm-hmm. guy. You know, they're, they're not there for that. They're there to help you get to where you want to go. 
They're not there to tell you where to go. Yeah, exactly. And that was the lesson that we learned from Shenandoah. It was <laughs> it was literally you? just plan your trips properly. Take the time to do the work beforehand. Get the maps. Get the trail planned out. Get the registrations, and everything will go smoothly for the most part. You I don't. Guess Sorry, I guess ahead. Andrew's. I guess Andrew's gotten a little better at that. Mm, yeah, <laughs> at least with the registration and the trail planning, but he still needs to deal with the packing before it's like the last minute. <laughs> uh, uh, another quick thing about Shenandoah was that when we hiked out, so our parents had dropped us off at the trailhead, right? And when we hiked out, we reached the the, the trailhead, and we realized that we had never spoken with our parents about when to pick us up <laughs> and we had no cell phone reception at, you know up there oh my so God. we ended up walking on the road for another probably two miles to get close enough to a cell phone tower so that we could call them it was it was undoubtedly the worst planned trip we've ever taken <laughs> so if you are new to camping or even if you're not new to camping but you know emphasize if you're new to camping because you might not do this plan everything properly look at the websites look at the maps call the place and just make sure you have as many things prepared as possible because if something does go wrong then at least you won't have other things to worry about and have backup plans mm -hmm. plan b plan c yeah do the research too like i know a lot of people like to ask us questions about oh this is my first time camping um you know what should i do with this and and we'll give you some tips but we can't give you all the tips you need to you know, there's probably better people you could talk to, like people who know have more experience, or you could go to websites and read about it. Just just because we don't want you to rely specifically on our our advice. The the best advice we can give anybody is uh, how to carry tripods through the woods. <laughs> oh yeah, I've <laughs> we've got come that up down with, pat. <laughs> yeah, we've come up with multiple techniques. We're yeah. uh, we're actually going to write a book on carrying <laughs> tripods. I've got my uh, uh, my. Over the sh well, everybody's got their <laughs> kind of like over the sh one shoulder technique, and I'm going with like the carrying the two water bucket style. You, know you, how you, you guys, you guys have it easy though. You guys don't have mountains. I, <laughs> I, I have mountains. I got to carry my thing up. But luckily, but I your gotta, is yours a, the ten pound tripod? No, it's not the ten pound tripod. Okay. Yeah, ten pound tripod. It's the uh, <laughs> I forget which one Andrew got me, but it's a little maybe f at three pounds. I don't know. Me it's and Andrew were light. thinking about picking that one up too for. For, oh, that's uh, great. Filming our own things, like when we're doing side videos. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> segue into, um, I think, Thomas, you were on a recent, like, mountaineering yeah, thing. Something speak, happened? Speaking of mountains, um, so a few, uh, about a month ago or so, maybe two, I don't know, two months ago, it's April already, uh, I took an REI class uh, in the mountains. It was called, it's a mountaineering 101 or something like that. It took place at Mount Baldy, if anyone from LA is listening you should know where Mount Baldy is. If not, look it up. It's one of the best places you, you have in this, this city. Uh, and in February, there's still a bit of snow up in the mountains. So we drove there uh, and we hiked up to the Baldy Bowl. And they're going to teach us all about how to use the equipment, when ice axes, crampon, micro spikes, uh, helmets, and how to you know, hike with an ice axe, self-belay, self-arrest, all these things that you need someone to teach you not you know you can teach yourself because usually when you use those things you're trying to prevent you from dying mm -hmm. so it's not like well, i'm just going to teach myself how to stop myself from dying on the fly <laughs> it's it's not that easy so uh I, that's why i signed up for this class so i was taking the class and we were hiking up to the place where we were going to practice which is maybe uh, like a thousand foot elevation gain from where we parked mm -hmm. uh and uh, it was about a three mile hike or so. Yeah. So it was, we were hiking at a pretty fast pace. So about an hour and a half after we started the hike and we were settling down and I was putting down my backpack, you know, I'm seeing some people, some, you know, what look like experienced mountaineers up in the bowl trying to get to the summit. And it's really fascinating for me because I've never seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting down my pack and I just kind of hear like this, this, like like snow falling it's not it's not like loud like an avalanche just like you know pitter patter of snow kind of rolling down the side of a hill mm -hmm. and i look up and i see this man he's uh he's tumbling head first and i mean tumbling like 
like like a cartoon character almost it's mm-hmm. terrifying mm-hmm. uh going through just narrowly avoiding some of these trees some of these rocks and lands maybe about i don't know 50 yards in front of me uh up the side of the mountain and i call over to the instructor and i say i don't think that guy's okay and the instructor called out and uh the guy was not really moving and then eventually he kind of just slowly sat up and then just kind of lied back down and the instructor was like that guy is not okay wow. so the how uh, close was this to you about 50 yards wow oh so it was like right next to you. no i i could wow. see the guy's face oh my um God. so the rei instructor luckily they all have like a lot of great training uh and an emt who was part of the learning who was a student there uh they rushed up to him and you know tried to try to take a look now i couldn't get up there just because they didn't want to crowd the guy yeah but uh from what i heard uh, the guy had like a huge laceration on his face i mean i could see the blood on his face Mm -hmm. uh at least two broken bones uh you know some leg damage just and like i said there's a laceration on his face but he also lost like a lot of skin on his face because he was getting i want to say rug burn but it's not rug burn snow burn Mm -hmm. so uh you're looking up there and you can see the streak of red in the in the white snow Mm -hmm. uh and it's just his blood just leading to him and the guy is the guy is not okay uh so they had to air airlift him out of there Mm -hmm. and we saw the helicopter uh come in swoop in they dropped a guy the guy examined him and then they brought him back up a few uh like 20 minutes later into the helicopter and uh it was very educational for me because i had never done mountaineering or anything like that before and i realized just how serious of a recreation it actually is it's not something that you can just Mm -hmm. uh kind of pick up and and you know oh i'm gonna try this out it seems like a cool idea but mountaineering is fundamentally different from hiking correct yes and no it's it's hiking in the snow at really steep elevations so it's like Mm -hmm. you know it's still a lot of leg work uh but it's a lot more balance yeah and you know but it's basically lo- something that it's not something that somebody could just be like i'm gonna go mountaineering like like people could probably go hiking and camping regardless of their experience and come out relatively fine but this is definitely yeah. something that you'd need experienced lessons you know learn how to yeah. do it right and that's that's the danger of mountaineering is people don't think that yeah. and people think you know if they if they have one successful mountaineering trip where they buy an ice axe and they're like, oh, okay, I climbed to the top of this mountain with my ice axe the first time. It's like, great. But you could have done that with just a trekking pole. The purpose of the ice axe is to stop yourself from falling. Yeah. You know, you, you, dig, you dig the axe part into the snow so that way you don't go rolling down the mountain. <laughs> you can't do that with a, with a trekking pole. So people don't, people who are inexperienced don't know how to do that. And that's why I took the classes, so you know I would I would know what the heck I was doing. Mm-hmm. And actually, talking about learning from experiences, uh, I kind of swore it off. I was never going to do mountaineering. Uh-huh. Uh, having said that, I'm doing Mount Whitney in early June, and there's a ton of snow up there, and I'm going to have to do some mountaineering there. So it's not going to be nearly as intense as what I saw up in Mount Baldy, but uh, I am so glad I took those classes because otherwise. Uh, Mount Whitney would be completely off limits to me. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, you know, I've recently. Okay, so this is kind of like a side note, but at the gym that I go to, they have a theater room, and the last few times I've been going, they've had that uh, Everest movie playing. I think. Oh it is. yeah. <laughs> so when you're talking about this, all I all I'm picturing is like you and some people like on the middle of Everest. Like I, the only thing I can think of is the shots that I saw in Everest, which is kind of funny. Cause I'm like, it's probably not that extreme, but <laughs> no, <laughs> but they like airship the guy out in Everest. So I'm like, Oh man, that sounds really scary. <laughs> so would you say that the thing you learned from it was basically don't go do something that you're not prepared for basically learn about you- it. You know, and that's actually interesting. I got a message from somebody who was saying, who was asking if a hike that I recently posted online was uh, good for be- for beginners. And I never want to say no. Don't do this if you're only a beginner. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, what I told them was just do it. 
until you feel like your 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 health is at risk, your safety is at risk, and then don't do it anymore. The problem is you have to be really smart about when your health is at risk. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so when it comes to mountaineering, you know, if you can do it on a little hill, fine, that's great. Teach yourself there, but don't go up to like Mount Baldy <laughs> at nine thousand feet elevation where there's an eight hundred foot drop. <laughs> be smart. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, awesome. Well, you know, that's like the first time I've heard you tell that story because I know you, like right after it happened, you were like, oh my God, guys, this thing <laughs> happened. But you've never like told me the full story. So that's pretty intense. Yeah, it was. Um, but speaking of mountains. Um, How about those Smokies? <laughs> uh, you guys have probably seen our Smoky Mountain video. But probably what you seen. might not have known was that was not our first experience in the Smokies. Um, uh. our first experience in the Smokies was quite different. <laughs> <laughs> this was still, yeah. I think, uh, this was the, this was after Shenandoah, correct? And before Yellowstone, our first Yellowstone? Uh, no, this was, this was after Yellowstone. Really? This was my friend. Yeah, this was my freshman year of college. How are we still so dumb after Yellowstone? I guess Yellowstone <laughs> well, we... technically wasn't all backpacking. No, we only did like two nights of backpacking in Yellowstone. Yeah. So that yeah. doesn't count. But Although, Smokies... to, be, to be fair, um, one of the problems we had in this one was not knowing our limits, and mm-hmm. in the Smokies, when we or when we went to Yellowstone and Tetons, the the route Andrew had originally planned was way out of our limits. Do you remember that? I think I was the loop. part of that plan. Yeah. Oh, the loop. Okay. oh my god. No, well, that lesson was, learned, right? <laughs> yeah. Some never let someone who's uh, lived uh, lived in the plains of the Midwest plan a hike in the mountains <laughs> if they've never seen mountains before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, um. So basically, Smokies. the story that I want to tell you guys is about our first Smokies experience and um, basically how it went down. Um, and this is kind of, it's kind of good that Thomas is the one talking with me today because uh, he was involved in my half of the story. Um, but basically, we had arrived at the Smokies with the plan to do this this loop that we had planned. Uh, we got there and the weather was great. And uh, we we headed we head out onto the trail, and we come across this river that we're supposed to ford, and apparently it had been raining a lot the days previous. So this river was very high and very fast, and I don't remember who it was. I'm almost certain it was you, Thomas, that actually mm-hmm. said we should tr- go for it. It was me. <laughs> out of all the people, uh, Thomas was the one who, who who's generally <laughs> play it safe kind of guy. Was like. We should go for it. And we're like, Thomas, come on. Even Andrew knows that we shouldn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> so we got uh, stuck at that part and we ended up. Um, so basically we at that river, we, we decided to change the direction that we were going on the trail and we hiked out to a different campsite. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was at that campsite that we decided that we wouldn't be able to do this loop and we would have to hike back to our car and figure something else out. So the next day. We hiked back to our car, and Thomas and I... We didn't feel so hot. Yeah, we didn't feel good. We, it wasn't that we were, like, you know, sick or anything like that. We were just, like, so tired, and we we basically decided that whatever loop they wanted to do, we probably wouldn't be able to handle it. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't the Thomas that you know today who's hiking up mountains and everything. <laughs> so Or the Brian. Yeah. Well, I'm still... I'm still well, no, you, you, you. I complain de- less. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I like less. rest at every point I can get. But anyways, so basically, what ended up happening was that Andrew and Robbie decided they would go do this uh, smaller loop by themselves, and Thomas and I, we would just do our own thing, right? Mm-hmm. So what happened was Andrew and Robbie, who were sick of having so much weight in their backpack, eliminated as many things as they could from their their backpack too many things i would say <laughs> they would argue that they were fine but they were starving by the end of it and i no, was that, that's the thing even they knew they weren't fine that's how <laughs> bad they were yeah they, they they won't admit it they would be like oh it wasn't too bad we were just hungry and i was like yeah but you were hungry like it, literally if we hadn't if that was you know had been longer than you probably would have been in trouble and if you hadn't run into those people who gave you food <laughs> <laughs> but anyways their story i'll leave that for them to tell their side of the story someday what happened with me and Thomas is we ended up staying at a few campgrounds um, and doing some day hikes. But um, 
<laughs> we actually went to a burger joint in we, we Gatlinburg. We ate out so much. We ate out at a burger joint in Gatlinburg. And then we at, then some other time we went to a KFC. And I feel really guilty when I say it out loud on the podcast. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's just something that we had to learn from. Like, when we were at the experience, you know, we realized we didn't know our limits we mm. first of all we didn't know <laughs> how far we could hike in a day with what we were carrying and another thing we learned was that we need to pack a lot smarter yeah um thomas i think you were packing how much clothes were you packing? oh god i it was it was so many so many <laughs> unnecessaries i i brought like a pair of underwear and a spare pair for basically every day that I was planning on being in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> and, because having clean underwear is super important when you're you know, hiking and, 20 miles a day. And <laughs> I, 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 I should have gone online, but I listened to my mom. And my mom, I love her, but she's never gone backpacking in her life. So mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know why. She, I think she told me, and I... I'm probably putting blame where it doesn't need to be, but <laughs> mom, if mom, if you're listening, I think you told me to bring like underwear for every day I was coming. Uh, if not, I, I'll, I'll call you and I'll apologize, but <laughs> I should not have brought under, I should brought maybe two pairs of underwear and that was it. <laughs> yeah. Um, clothes. Better yet, none. This kind of goes back to the thing about equipment that you buy too, because it's worth it to spend at least okay so when you're more experienced it's worth it to spend the money not for the dur- not only for the durability but also for saving some weight um like investing in a good gas or wood burning stove will mm-hmm. save you a lot of weight in, when you want to cook a meal um buying like uh uh dehydrated foods uh efficient ways of carrying water it's it's a lot of things that you'll eventually own when you camp it adds up to saving a lot of weight. And then that in turn lets you, you know, hike further, basically enjoy the trip more because you're not as tired. Mm -hmm. And that's something that when we first started filming Adventure Archives, I found that, you know, by the end of it, I'd be so extremely tired that I just couldn't really enjoy it. I just wanted it to be done. Um, Of course, I always look back on it with fond memories, but yeah, um, the endurance is something that you have to work up to. And, and since we don't get out as often as we usually do, it's been tough to, you know, build up the endurance. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's something I'm actually working on now for Mount Whitney is getting that endurance. So, mm-hmm. uh, it's a tough enough day hike already, but let alone making it a, uh, day hike and a filming hike. Mm-hmm. It, filming just adds so much extra yeah. stuff. Why don't you tell us about, your first experience filming with us on Yosemite. Oh, yeah, it was. I think I talked about it in a little earlier podcast, uh-huh. but you guys, you guys are just the worst people to <laughs> go on a hike with. Uh, for anyone who wants to hike with us, reconsider. Not because <laughs> uh, we wouldn't love to have you. We would love to have you, but uh, uh, if you want to go anywhere, uh, just don't expect to go anywhere fast. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it's it's something that I've mentioned to you know, our little group here and there, but a lot of people sometimes reach out to us and they're like, Hey, you know, if you guys are hiking in the area, I'd love to come with you. And and like Thomas said, we'd love to do that, but there's just something we need to warn you about. Don't go in with the <laughs> expectation of hiking, you know, eight, nine, 10 miles a day and everything's going smoothly because to get the shots that we do, well, why don't you tell them Thomas what, what we do? Well, I you you guys just take your take your merry little time to make sure every shot is perfect, yes. and that's great because it looks really not to toot our own horns, but it looks really good on camera. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I went on a hike two weekends ago. It was a fourteen mile hike on paper. My pedometer said eighteen miles, mm-hmm. um, and I filmed much of the first part. And I filmed none of the second part, yeah. <laughs> just because uh, I was, yeah, I was like, yeah. wow, it took us six hours to hike uh, six miles. Now we have another eight miles to hike, and I have to get back to the car in four hours. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah. it's not going to work. So anyway, it's you just 
we come up with our own thing uh and you probably we'll talk about it another yeah. time it, it's something that we have to factor in when we do our packing is you know we've got a 10 pound tripod to carry we've got two cameras we've got batteries and memory cards um and the the steady cam also so you know um when we pack like we say pack smart so you always have to factor in everything that you plan on bringing Mm -hmm. and and all of this comes back to what have we learned you know going back to what we did whether it be from cameras to gear to training to knowing your limitations all this stuff kind of you know every time you go into nature you take something back like i said it's not usually something physical unless Mm -hmm. you have a squirrel in your pack (laughs) What's it with you and squirrels? I don't know. I'm in a very squirrely, <laughs> squirrely mood today. Uh, so anyway, um, Brian, anything else you want to talk about learning experiences? I know we have some questions to answer. Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to add on to what you just said. Um, basically, don't worry about your experience. Everybody, regardless of how much experience they have hiking, they, they will almost always come back from a trip with something that they've learned something to rather whether it's just to improve their next trip or something to improve themselves Mm -hmm. um that's just how i feel about each trip we take yeah we 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 didn't grow up as boy scouts we didn't grow up as people who like lived in the woods who's you know we're not those people we've this is something we've really just kind of grown into over the past five six years Mm mm-hmm and uh so by no means are we we professional hikers or professional climbers definitely not professional climbers but yeah uh this is just a a hobby of ours that has grown into something that we take a little bit more seriously correct um so anyway uh if you want real professional advice we'd recommend going to like (laughs) a camping store and talking to some people there or taking like a class like thomas did about mountaineering yeah 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 if you want to see a bunch of idiots do some funny things sometimes, <laughs> then we're, we're, we're your group of people. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, looks like we've questions. got some questions uh, that we're going to answer here. Um, okay. This is off the record, Thomas, but let's just start from the top. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll go with the first one. Okay. So the first question from Gerald Witty, he says, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? And would Andrew use the woodchuck shavings for tinder to start a fire? And the answer is a woodchuck would chuck as much wood as it could chuck. I'll just throw that right what, back at what you. Does chuck, <laughs> I'll throw that ambiguity right back at you. What, what, does, chuck, what does chuck actually mean? Um, does, it, does it mean like chuck like I'm going to throw like chuck, chuck a baseball or something? Or does chuck mean like gnaw on it with your, their teeth? Because I, I I've never Chuck, really understood that. I think Chuck could mean like you know, like if you're swinging an axe at something, you're chucking the axe at it. I guess I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't. But I can tell you that definitely, Andrew would use the wood. Well, first he would look at the shavings and he'd be like, "Oh wow, woodchuck was here," and then he'd pocket the shavings and use it as tinder to start a fire. <laughs> and then he would identify the tree that the shavings came from. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, next question, Thomas. Next question. All right, from Peter Som. How is hiking and camping? Oh, sorry. How ha, how has hiking and Start camping over. changed? Start over with the name. All right. Uh, we got another question from Peter Som. Uh, question is: How has hiking and camping changed your perspective on life, if it changed it at all? Would you say the outdoors is a central or peripheral part of your life at this point? Uh, would you consider taking on a role of confer- conservationists in the future? Your time is valuable, and I thank you for it. Well, thank you, Peter. That's a wow. That's a very deep question. Um, you know, hold on, Thomas. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, just for the record, you can always cough and like un. And you can mute yourself. For yeah, this. I just didn't know how much coughing I had to do. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. Um, let me hang on just a second. Come in. No, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. So, uh, I'm gonna start Do with you want the me last to start? sentence. Okay. No, I got this. Okay. Uh, your time is valuable, and I thank you for it. Wow. Well, thank you, Peter. That's a wow. That's a really deep question. Thanks for uh, asking it. 
uh, whew, uh, I has is, is the outdoors a central or peripheral part of your life at this point? Now that's a to me that's a tough question because like the center of my life, I guess technically is my work, uh, like my real job, just because that's where I am most of my hours of the week, mm-hmm. uh, apart from my bed, and. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sitting there, so I guess that's like technically the central center of my life. But don't believe that I'm not sitting there. For every hour I'm sitting there, don't believe that at least five of those minutes, probably, you know, if we're going to be honest, thirty or so, I'm thinking about what can I do, like how can I, you know, what's outside that I can be doing right now or something like that. And I love my job, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but it's it's always on the back of your mind, and it's I, for me, I don't think it's ever going to go away. Yeah. It's like it's it's for me it's not the center but it's literally everything else around it uh in some way that it all comes back to just like getting outside Mm -hmm. and taking a role as conservationists i mean i i would love to be a con i you know i consider myself somewhat of a conservationist i mean I, i probably could go out and pick up the trail uh, with the Sierra Club every weekend, but uh, I'm not quite there yet. Maybe someday, definitely, uh, if I'm older and I have, like, and I don't feel like doing the miles that I do now, uh, definitely I would love to become a conservationist. What about you, Brian? Um, well, for that first part of the question, I would say that it has changed my perspective on life. Um, maybe not as profoundly as some people might think but basically what it has made me think is that for life life is what you make of it basically it don't expect things to happen and like momentous things to happen to you you need to go out and you need to make the most of life Mm -hmm. basically you know every time we go out and we do a trip it's because we want to go out there and we want to do this trip or we want to film this episode and we never regret it. Uh, So that's just how like I see things now. It's like, you got to go and you got to do the thing that you want to do because otherwise it's not going to happen. Um, And that kind of pertains back to us and, and, and how we started venture archives. We've always talked about it, but until we actually started, went out there and started filming, you know, we never realized we'd come this far. Um, would I say that outdoors is a central or peripheral part of my life? I would say it's probably peripheral right now. Um, that's more due to just, you know, life and my schedule right now. Uh, I, I, I think if I had more time, it would definitely take a larger chunk of it because there's been many times where, you know, the weekend has come up and I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, man, I really want to just go somewhere and, and camp out for the night because it just mm-hmm. feels like it'd be really good right now. And also, I think maybe once the weather starts improving, uh, I'll be more inclined to get out a little bit more often. <laughs> yeah, you guys freaking have snow going yep, on. And it's it, like, it snowed today. Uh, it's almost the middle of April. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's crazy, dude. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question. Do you want to – how about you read this one, Brian? Sure. Uh, the next question we got is from James Maltese. Um, he says, what items are okay to buy knockoffs and what items would you spend some money on? Also, pros and cons of camping alone. Brian, um, you got this one. Yeah. We mentioned this earlier in the podcast, and I will say this now. Uh, do the research and then buy. Um, don't buy knockoffs. Uh, if you're worried about spending too much money, um, you can go for maybe a slightly cheaper version of a good brand. But like Thomas and I said, you, the money that you put into your gear is going to pay off generally because you're taking the stuff out, you're being rough with it, and you're going to want something that's not going to fail on you when you're out there. And about the only thing I could say you could buy knockoffs of is maybe food um, because you don't have to necessarily go out there and buy those camping brand freeze-dried foods or whatever. You know, I just buy like a dollar packet of add hot water rice and it serves me perfectly fine um pros and cons of camping alone those uh that that's kind of opinionated basically because some people prefer camping alone um andrew robbie and i and thomas have always 
for the most part, camped as a group together. And we much prefer that way, but just because of the camaraderie you have. Um, you know, you get to talk, you get the support of each other if, you know, you're tired or something. And it's just a, I view it as a group activity. If I wanted to be alone, I could be alone in my room on a weekend. Not to state anything about my personal life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, next question. Mark uh, Mark Sculetti. I think that's how I pronounce it. If I'm not, I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, any advice you can give a beginner backpacker about not over or under packing before a first weekend trip? Hmm. Now, Another Mark, topic we discussed. Yeah, Mark, i got to be honest with you. Uh, I've only gone technically backpacking twice, so I don't. Again, this goes back to me not being a professional voice here, mm-hmm. but having severely overpacked once and then packed just the right amount the second time, I can tell you, don't bring more clothes than you need. <laughs> <laughs> no matter no matter what what you think, no matter how many pairs of uh, underwear you think you need, socks you need, uh, yeah. basically any girl that you meet out there, Mark, if you're looking to meet a girl out in the wilderness uh you know just there's a common understanding that personal hygiene is important to some degree (laughs) but uh when it comes to smelling bad you're going to smell bad and just just embrace it so you know no need no need to bring deodorant no need to bring four pairs of underwear you can leave your deodorant uh, maybe if you're going with other people and if like you're going to be sleeping in the same tent with someone yeah Well, you know, I Personal personally preference. would not want to sleep in a tent with someone who has some bad BO, and I would appreciate it if they brought deodorant. Yeah, well, if you're bringing a bag of beans, uh, you got some worse things to worry about. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to add on to Thomas' answer here. Um, it may sound silly about the clothes thing, but it's very true. A lot of people probably do overpack clothes and certain things on their first trip. Um, basically, what you want to make sure is to not underpack on important things like water mm-hmm. um and food uh because bag all, water sorry. were you gonna say something i was gonna say bag all your food don't bring any cans yeah yeah um with the food you know if you're gonna bring things that are non-perishable i would recommend if they've got if they come in like heavy packages you know maybe you could like take them out of the package and put them in a ziploc bag or something like that but yeah. um Water, I mean, you can always overpack water. If you have too much, you can always drink it or you can just dump some out somewhere. And food, you know, food will only get less and less as you go through. Mm -hmm. Um, And like Thomas said, clothes is really a minor necessity because you're going to be out there. You're going to get dirty anyways. Um, If you change into clean clothes, you'll feel good for like the first two hours of a hike and then you're just going to be dirty again. Um, So... If you're a first time and you're not sure, I would say the safe thing to do is to overpack, but be smart about it. Because yeah. if you underpack and something goes wrong, then you're going to be in trouble. Uh, yes. Tina Marie, next question. Brian, do you want to read that? Uh, yeah. Um, she asks, uh, have any of you ever attended any wilderness survival classes? Nope. Um, no. And I'm, I have attended and- a class about navigation with like a compass <laughs> but i don't think that fully counts as a wilderness survival class and i know andrew has done a i don't know if it was survival or if it was just fire starting but he did do something with dave canterbury yes um, so maybe we'll have him pose this question in the next podcast where he can talk about his experience mm-hmm. frank daly or dolly i'm sorry frank i would say it's frank, last daly. Name. frank daly <laughs> uh do any of you guys keep mementos from your trips or collect anything I don't know. I try. I generally try not to, just because uh, of leave no trace. Yeah. the The rule of thumb actually is to, if you bring it in, you bring it out. If you find it there, you leave it there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that being so said, yeah, uh, I have. When we went to Mammoth, the island that we stayed on uh, for the night had really cool, like very smooth rocks, and I did take one home as a souvenir because I just thought it was really cool. Um, but for the most part. I wouldn't take anything physical, you know, take a picture, take a video, write in your diary, but don't bring Mm -hmm. like plants or sticks or things like that. You know, there, there's an exception or not an exception, but I forgot about this one. It says we didn't get on camera, but when we went to Yosemite, 
uh, I actually wrestled a bear. And uh, I punched the bear, and it died. And I have the bear's head mounted above my 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 bed. So I guess that's a little memento. Yes, Thomas Sennard, <laughs> bear hunter. <laughs> uh, next question. Um, Brian. Looks like Levi Hammett asks, will you come back to Morgan Monroe Force? Uh, I can show you some other cool things you missed. Um, Morgan Monroe, that was in Indian, Indiana. Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely head back there. I'm not certain if we'll actually film because we've already been there. Um, but it's a close enough place that, you know, it's convenient for us to go. And maybe we can just go just to hang out with you, Levi, um, and, you know, just go out for a night. I would totally be down for that. Morgan Monroe was beautiful the first time we went, and I'd love to go there, like in the spring or summer. I think it would be fun. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to see another video. So I hope you guys film there sometime. Mm-hmm. Uh, Meeksy Meeks, I think that's how you pronounce it. Meeksy, how are you? Uh, question is, he, this when is, is the Mike next Truong? So shout out to him and the oh, is this Mike stuff? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Uh, when is the next? When is the next adventure west? Yosemite, Tahoe, Zion, Rockies, Big Sur, and or Catalina? Can I come along? <laughs> Answer is yes. Hopefully, all of them at some point. Uh, I keep looking at Catalina, asking myself, when am I going to go there? Uh, and can you come along? We would love for you to come along. The only question is, can you bear to hike with us and then stop every ten minutes to film? <laughs> it's not even ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's come on. It's at least minutes. every three minutes. <laughs> oh my god. So the the question is. Can you bear to come along? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Russ Cosby. Okay. Um, yeah, Russ Cosby asks, uh, well, uh, I don't think this was an actual question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Uh, next, so. next question. Okay. Another question from Frank Daly. Um, he says, if there's something you could change about the national park system or add to it, what would it be? Um, I would add to it a bigger budget. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I would, I would, I would second that. And on top of that, uh, I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings because on one hand, I want everyone to go to the national parks, but on the other hand, if too many people go to national parks, uh, it kind of defeats the point of national parks, you know, in the wilderness and the uh, the, the pristine of it all. So mm-hmm. uh, I don't have a solution to that. Uh, maybe they should let some filmers, uh, some filmers. That's not a word. Is it some uh, cinematographers, some people with uh, cameras go in, film it, and then uh, (coughs) just cut this whole part out. (laughs) (laughs) Again, again, Meeksy Meeks, uh, last question. Brian, I'm going to let you uh, answer this, but the question is Desert Island alone. What is the one food? What is the one album? And what is the one person, dead or alive? And what is the one luxury item you would have? Mm-hmm. All right, Brian. Um, what is the one food? Let's start with that. The one food would be okay. Disregarding any sort of health or anything like that, the one food yes. would be pizza. What is the one album? Uh, the one album would be um, orchestral symphony of Zelda. I, I don't know if that's the official name of it. Yeah. Um, they're great yeah they're it, great. i like them for some reason i just like it <laughs> what is the one person dead the or one alive person. and i think uh we should make this the point here of saying that it can't be okay no no one person if i had to choose from anyone it would be Les stroud <laughs> okay <laughs> because and... he would help me survive but <laughs> if i didn't couldn't choose like a survivalist then it would be um, Adam Savage of the Mythbusters, because I think he'd be extremely entertaining to hang out with on a desert <laughs> island. Finally, what is the one luxury item you would have? A speedboat. <laughs> speedboat. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> All right. And how about you, Thomas? What is my one food? Mm-hmm. I would go with a kiwi. Just one kiwi? One single kiwi. <laughs> no, but literally kiwi? Like, if you had choice of one food, you'd go with one kiwi? One kiwi. Okay. <laughs> sure, <laughs> we'll go with that. How about the one album? Nickelback. <laughs> okay, now you're just messing with me. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, not Nickelback. I don't know. Uh, I, I would, know you, I, know, I, you know, know, actually, there's this really good album, um, it's nature sounds and there's actually one really good one about uh 
hold on. You're saying you want an album of nature sounds when you're yeah, on a desert yeah. island. I, I would want one of just waves crashing. <laughs> what is the one person, dead or alive? Um I would uh I would want uh Axel Rose from Guns N' Roses. I don't know if that's an actual I I'd want Axel from Guns N' Roses. Uh why? Singing, because uh, uh, I would want him to sing that I'm a cowboy and I'm wanted dead or alive. And what's your one luxury <laughs> item? Uh, a bigger speedboat than yours. Okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> I, I, I still kind of want to change my one person. All right, um, who's it? I'll go with Scarlett Johansson. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that looks like that's this all the questions that we had. Um, Adventure Archives After Dark. Oh, my gosh. Maybe that's anyway. something we'll have to start. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I... that, that's about all we have had to discuss for today. Um, mm-hmm. We want to thank all of you guys listening to our podcast and supporting our channel. And uh, thank you so much, so much to all our patrons. Uh, you guys, you know, it's, it's really... Mo- mo- uh, it's it's motivating for us and it's really moving for us too that you know you guys have supported us this much um you know the more we continue to grow the better our content will be and uh the more we can give to you guys uh thank you so so much especially to uh uh those who uh donated recently donated a hundred dollars that means it we we were floored when we saw that uh so thank you so much for listening to the podcast uh next week I'll finally get a hold of Andrew and I can, you can hear me yell at Andrew for not prepping this Mount Whitney hike. Uh, so anyway, Brian, finish this off. Yeah. Um, so you can check us, you can like us on Facebook. Uh, just look up adventure archives. If you want to f- support us on Patreon, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash adventure. Um, and we also have an Instagram. It is at a D V a R C H. You can see pictures of me. Anyway, thank you so much, guys, and uh, we will see you next Monday. All right. See you guys. Bye.